Hello, everyone. Good afternoon or good evening. It is January 13, year 2022, 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And today's talk is going to deal with the kings of pain and the monetization of hurt. And um, that's reminiscent of the song, of course, by is it the police or was it a Sting solo song? I think it was with the police, the, the King of Pain. Really good song. And uh, if you don't think that there is, uh, there are kings of pain and that hurt and pain and injury, psychic or physical, spiritual injury has not been monetized, then um, you'll have to take a look at this book. It's called The Empire of Pain. And this inspired the title. This is a really important book. It might take me a week to get through it, or I might just go with it starting next week. And uh, this is the type of author I also want to include along with Kirby Summers and uh, people like Manny Grossman and other um, individuals that have been here on this channel. Patrick Radden Keefe. And he also... Uh, is a writer or was maybe a freelancer. I don't know if he's a staff writer for The New Yorker, just like our friend Ronan Farrow. And I mentioned these, what may seem to be trivial pieces of information, because again, I want to caution our research community from foreclosing alliances and uh, really tapping into knowledge and, and, and information from other communities because they're mainstream media or they're communists or they're left. You know, there's all these labels and I get these trolls here and I check them out. They usually have a fake account. One person said in response to my piece that I did on Art Bell and the martyrs of radio, it wasn't just about Art Bell, it was about other people who you would think that, okay, you're a talk radio host or you're, you have a show and, um, what could be more benign than that? Well, a few of them have been killed, and I suspect to Art Bell's. To, um, I don't think I won't say he's been he was murdered, but uh, he's definitely in the gun sights of uh, certain individuals. But anyway, this person said, "Oh, he's CIA." See, that's just kind of lazy thinking, and it's also self righteous. It's also uh, gives you a sense of or these people, I think, a sense of uh, superiority and understanding this. But you know, it's so easy. It's so trivial. So if any of you are, who are watching right now, right at the top of the show, go, go somewhere else because you know what? You're, um, you're a dead weight, so to speak. You're just baggage. Anyway, I'm going to focus on uh, the people here today, including uh, Melissa. Yes. Hello. How are you today? And oh, I'm welcome you, welcoming you. And I'm going to be taking more comments today and observations, uh, slow it down a little bit so that it doesn't seem so fragmented. I'm interested in what my group here, my people, my tribe has to say about what's been going down lately. And that would include Ms. Piper Fogel. Yes, how are you today? And oh, thank you for watching. Oh, I should mention that if you're having problems, because I sent it to the Patreon people, if you're having problems getting to the interview, what happens, I think, is that it stays on YouTube for a short time, then it gets archived into the Caravan to Midnight subscribers only page. So you have to go there. And if anybody came in late, you probably are going to miss most of it or at least part of it. If you were there live, and, and again, I apologize for not giving you forewarning or giving you a heads up, but I, I only got notification that that evening before. And then I had to wait until the site was live before I could link it to Patreon. So you only had like a couple hours of uh, of notification. I'm sorry about that. So, But if I can find an audio um, excerpt of that talk, because I agree, Piper, it, uh, not just because I was on it, but I think it was a, it's John B. Wells who makes the show. All right. So, <laughs> But I do agree with you. It was uh, an excellent uh, conversation that we had. And we got to nerd out about the Beatles towards the end and our favorite uh, period in music. I think he has a certain fondness for a certain era of music, and so do I, and it's, it's valid today in 2022. 
as it is then. And also, I'm not locked in it. I, I like the country music of the 1950s. I like the jazz and the music of my parents' generation. And I'll go back 200 years, you know. Um, and I like some material uh, that's released today. I can't, uh, besides John Mayer, I can't really think of many people I've been looking at lately. And I didn't like the John Mayer album, but I felt duty bound to to check it out. So again, that's all part of this ethic that I embody or promote. And that is look at everything. Don't foreclose your opportunities. Read everybody, check them out. You may think uh, there's nothing to be found here, but uh, most often you will be pleasantly surprised. And I like that feeling myself. I my, I, my gosh. And, and I'm going to share with you some some material uh, that demonstrates that principle of research, which is keeping an open mind. Again, I learned it at Bowling Green State University in the Popular Culture Studies program. So thank you very much, Piper, for watching. And hopefully I have more information about uh, John B. Wells and his expanding network of offerings there. And let's see what Michael Charlie has to say. Oh, yeah. Oh, of course. Thank you for reminding Michael Hoffman the second will be on. It's going to be taped. I was in communication with him yesterday. So if you do, Michael or anybody else, Michael Charlie, if you want to send me a message, a Patreon. Patreon has a message feature there, and, and I'll record these, and I'll pass them on to him in advance so he can consider them, look at them. Uh, maybe you'll have more of an elaborated uh, response if he has time to think about it. However, we only have, first it was 45 minutes. Now he, he says, okay, we'll go 60. I didn't have to twist his arm. He wants to talk about some other topics that, that we have a mutual interest in. So who knows? Maybe we'll be talking for for 90 minutes or two hours because it's recorded. It's not live like, like this. So, yeah, Michael, send that question to me, and I will forward it. And we have Jay Agare. I think I'm getting closer to pronouncing your name correctly. Is this about MK Ultra? No, because that's been done to death. I mean, a lot of it stems from it, but it's going to go way beyond that. Because I've, I've read the, most of the literature. I've seen most of the, the documentaries. I've read most of the books. And I assume that you have too. So I don't want to be a repeater, which is the case in uh, uh, YouTube, as well as these people who are snap experts on MK Ultra, they copy stuff off YouTube and they publish books on it or articles or whatever. And it's just rehashed. And I think that's uh, not only is it dishonest, it's, it's boring and it's keeping us running in circles. Um, yes. Hello, Pedro Rojas Cervantes. Yes, Miguel de Cervantes the great Spanish author of Don Quixote, a classic. <laughs> oh my God. And I, I read the, in, in English translation, of course, I read the whole thing. And there's a reason why there's classics. Christopher Lee, hi. Yes, indeed. And Maureen, how are you doing today? Yes, hi, everybody. And Trap a Skunk, how do you like my new toy here? I, I found out how to put the messages on there, finally. See, I was worried about doing this before I practice because I didn't want to click myself out of the show accidentally, right? And just end, end it. So I had to kind of play with it a little bit. And now I'm doing overdoing it. <laughs> um, and we have uh, 96 Tears, question mark, and the Mysterians. Marsha Ezel, greetings to you. All right. Thank you very much, Don. I appreciate Nadia Martinez. Hello, Paul Hudson. I'll get to the, the, the talk in a moment, and I'm going to take it slow, and I'm going to return to your questions as we go along here. And uh, my friend Corky Goss is here. Yes, how are you doing? And hey, Detroit Dave is back. How are you? Good. Man, we got to we need to find out the whole uh, veterans I'm talking to, to David Underdown right now addressing him. We got to find out about the whole VA Veterans Administration set up in Detroit because a lot of what we're going to talk about here is these programs is run through that captive population of uh, military personnel 
primarily through, we're talking about psychiatric uh, care, quote unquote care, at the VA hospital and all the major cities have them. And I'm going to talk about New York City in a moment when we finish up with Nile Rogers here. And uh, let's see. Oh, did I get to Debbie? No. How are you, Debbie? Nice to see you here. Ayape, greetings. And Christy Lee Bell, how are you again? Hey, Jerry Beck. Yes, we have to stop meeting right now. Let's keep it up. It's, it's so illicit. It's just the pleasure of these secret rendezvous. And Marty Farrell, yes, how are you doing? Good to see you. We're going to plow some new ground here today. Lisa James, yes, indeed. How are you, John Witt? And um, Salsa Norma. It's also easier to read when I have it on the screen here. I don't, you know, it's because it's really tiny in the chat room. Kevin Walsh, hi, how are you today? And who else do we have? We have Diana Pollux. Oh, you caught that one. Yes. But uh, this is Diana Pollux who's, who's on the screen here. Because some of you are away from the, the monitor screen. You're listening. So I'm just IDing you. Some of you are watching, but I know some people like to listen. Uh, yes, I dropped the bombshell. Uh, D Diana, are you referring to me referring to Dr. Uh, Robert Malone as a limited hangout? And I talked about the Malone PSYOP. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah. I wanted that to hit the mainstream news, and I wanted to go on the record that there's at least one person out here who was, I was a colleague of uh, Robert Malone at UC Davis for 21 years. I didn't work in the biology department like him, but I was on a campus. We're on the faculty council where we all get the, our paychecks from the same office in, in uh, Oakland, California. So I, I would call him a colleague. I mean, a professional. I didn't work with him, but I was, I was a fellow professor at the University of California. And uh, people like him, I mean, Joe Rogan might be overawed and, and dazzled by his white coat and the fact that uh, he's such a great and convincing actor. Uh, but people like him are a dime a dozen at the UC. That's why it's the UC. Those people are groomed from a very young age and they create legends and backstories for them and put them out there just as when the, their whole storyline is, is beginning to crumble and when books like Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s book on the real Anthony Fauci and uh, all these medical doctors and people who are in the health professions in general are coming out against the giant operation, who should appear but Dr. Robert Malone? Okay, that's all I'm going to say right now because I, I really went into it uh, yesterday. Yeah, but John was cool about it. I should tell you, Diana, we, we had a nice long talk. He called back. About a half an hour later, we talked for about a half a minute or 30 minutes, 45 minutes about that situation, as well as about other plans, future plans and, and whatnot. So but so everything's cool. We're 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 OK. We're OK. He, he understands where I was coming from and why I you know made that statement. And I've been going on that show since 2015, maybe perhaps even earlier. So I, I have a track record there of credibility. Okay, and passing through. I hope you're not passing through. Um, okay, Jesus Christ, yes. I do read the King James Bible, the Tanakh, as it's referred to amongst uh, people of the Judaic faith. We call it the Old Testament and the New Testament. I like to read the commentaries. I like to read the 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 uh, cultural and the historical information on it. It's just, it's wonderful. And I do it uh, not just because of its intrinsic interest. I also do it to negate a lot of the really ugly material that I that I read as part of doing this show, just like I do the music, the vibrations, to cleanse myself, uh, insulate myself, protect myself. Yeah, it's just, uh, it's self-maintenance, I guess you'd call it health maintenance, if you want to call it that. So thank you. For, see, see, this interaction kind of stimulates comments that I may not have thought about. Uh, through these sort of single-minded talks. Hi, yeah, reporting in. Okay, good to have you here. Dave, did you have a question? Oh, yeah, hey, <laughs> you come to the right show because I did a little bit more prepping on her, and I'm going to talk about Loretta Mindbender. Uh, that's another one to add, David, in in, in this net, this uh, network that you're building out here. And um, there's there's tons of people that 
that are unregarded. And she's especially interesting because she was a woman at a time where there were a few medical doctors, period, let alone as ones who are heading a huge unit at the very first public hospital in the United States of America, Bellevue Hospital in where? New York City, fun city, Como City. Yeah, that's Dr. Loretta Bender. So anyway, that's a whole talk in itself. And I hope you, you'll do, do uh, some digging in on her. But but I'm, I'm going to be alluding to her in a moment. But first of all, let me give some more love to the people here in the live chat. Paul Engelbrecht. And again, I apologize if I, apologize if I accidentally pass you over or do it twice here or, or mispronounce your name like right now. <laughs> I won't even try that. I don't know what V-O-R-O-N-G is, but... Uh, it's a stenographic communication. Uh, Jim Smith, it's Supreme Cluster. Yeah, I know what the second term of that phrase is. But we're gonna we're gonna overcome it. And well, we'll overcome it. Tom Colby, good morning to you. And I'm almost at the bottom here. Misdemeanor. Yes, misbehavior is what's definitely needed. Oh, you're doing dishes. Okay, so <laughs> I'll talk louder so you can hear over the the uh, the water flow there. And I think I've gotten every to everybody once at least here. Maybe not Patrick Mullen. Maybe I did got you already there. But anyway, wouldn't hurt. Okay, Jesus Chagola, welcome Sharon Davis. You put your got your name up in lights here. So anyway, I'm going to move to today's talk and um, talk talk about how pain itself, suffering, mental, physical anguish, in, injury, how it became a commodity, an industrial commodity that's bought, sold, and traded on the big board. And for those of you who don't know. And it's not like I'm an insider or anything, but on Wall Street, the people, the finance community, that's their term for the Wall Street big board with all the activity going on, the buying and the selling and trading. They call that the big board, right? So it is being sold on the big board and you have a whole financial empire. This is just one company of many. We know it is Purdue Pharma and we know the family as the Sacklers. And again, let's give the... The um, the New York, the New Yorker magazine, it's proper, it's proper respect. Okay, it's mainstream media, but so what? This is an excellent book, and I'm gonna I'll go through it through it um, starting next week. Okay, and uh, it affects everybody. Every book, every autobiography biography that I'm reading for the past ten years talks about some aspect of the so-called mental health community, psychiatric drugs, or uh, illicit or prescription drugs that are so central to their lives. This is part of the whole dissociative society that that has uh, kicked in with, with a vengeance. And uh, we're going to have to pull ourselves out of it, ladies and gentlemen. Otherwise, we're going to be ill-equipped to uh, to fight the, uh, the powers, the psycho powers that be. Okay, so there's a thumbnail that I got and I put it as part of the uh, the cover art for today on, on YouTube. And that is a still from a film. That's, um, is that Olivia de Havilland? Yeah, it's Olivia de Havilland, I believe. She's the star from the 1940s. This is of my parents' generation, of course. Um, yeah, but people of that generation, or, or film fans, would know who she is. But she, um, in 40, 1948, I think it was, she usually played... Not, I wouldn't say glamour girl, girl roles, but she played roles where her her she's an incredible beauty, right? <laughs> uh, but she was in movies that played that up. But she made a departure, conscious departure, and, and the producers were taking a risk, and the directors taking a risk. Hey, let's put her in a in a strange, unflattering light with no make, minimal makeup. She's still beautiful, by the way. <laughs> she's probably more beautiful, just sort of naturally. And she's in in, in an insane asylum as they used to call them back then. Maybe we should start really calling them insane asylums. Again, we should take back that term instead of calling mental health facilities or clinics, which 
like a la George Carlin, just obscures the, the true uh, and ugly uh, uh, banality of the evil that can take place in places like this. And that particular movie, The Snake Pit, I think it was a 20th Century Fox film, or I think it was, no, it was MGM, I think. It, was, it came out of a book that was written by a woman called The Snake Pit. It's autobiographical. This is, and this particular edition says it's the 75th anniversary edition of the book by Mary Jane Ward, who published this right after the war, 48, called The Snake Pit. And The Snake Pit is, are these psychiatric facilities. So it's not like we don't know them, and it's not like I'm discovering or bringing anything new to you here. Uh, it's been a triumph of public relations, Bernaysian uh, fetishization of the of the men and women in the white coat, especially of a psychiatric background. I mean, you got a psychiatrist, uh, Dr. Andrew Kaufman. He's a psychiatrist. You got a psychiatrist here who people bow down on. I don't know if he's been on the Joe Rogan show, but they bow down on him in, in saying that, hey, there's no such thing as the uh, COVID um, virus. I mean, it, just because he has an MD and he's a psychiatrist, does that mean he's an expert in, in the in the area of biology? But that I'm just using him as an example of the degree to which most of the, of the public puts their trust in people with these initials behind their name. And I'm, I don't mean to denigrate that. I, you know, they, they go through years and years of arduous study, even as undergraduates in medical school and all the, you know, I, I understand that. And the same holds true with Robert Malone. I don't mean to denigrate the achievement there. But while we're celebrating these talented individuals, men and women, both, including Dr. Lorette Bender of, she's long gone, but while, while we're recognizing and uh, giving them proper respect, let's also understand that we could be ingesting a poison pill at the same time. And that not that part of what a PSYOP, a successful PSYOP is? You, you're, getting, uh, you're getting played without even knowing it and even welcoming it. That's, that's a con. Co excuse me. Con is short for confidence. Confidence man. They gain your confidence with the white coat. With, with the uniform, whatever the badge of authority is, and then, man, they got gotcha. you. If they're manipulators, and a lot of them are, a lot of them are not. Probably most of them are not. So I don't want to smear everybody with the same brush here. So the king of pain, there is Olivia de Havilland in the classic film, The uh, Snake Pit, and you can't get it on Netflix anymore. You have to go to the the retailer that ate the world. I'll say at Amazon. I had to buy it because a lot of these films are going into the memory hole. So keep that in mind. Buy the hard copies of books and um, DVDs, CDs, and, and all of it because there's a stream, right? The stream can be cut off. You can cut off supply very easily. So um, as you know, I've recurrently have turned to this theme of psychology, psychiatry, neuroscience, psychotherapy, and this was not in, intentional. It's just that most of the, the material that I sift through in trying to understand the new world order and trying to understand the nature of dissociative society, that all trails lead back to post-war psychiatry, post-war psychotherapy, right? And um, full disclosure, just so you know that where, where I'm coming from, as we used to say in the, in the old days, where I'm coming from, I have never been in individual psychotherapy or group setting psychotherapy, all right? So I don't have an ax to grind. At the same time, I don't feel superior to people who have been or are. are. I'm just making some comments here. I won't, I'm not disrespecting you. Um, I'll never go and I'll tell you this, I will never submit to that type of situation. And I've been told to invite it and, uh, uh, and coerced into, to going into type, these types of settings as part of my job, my profession. Um, and they do it so they can get a psychiatric profile on you and possibly have you committed or in some fashion put away if that ever you know, people say, Oh, that, that'll never happen here. Right. Look, look where we're at here in 2022. 
So that's my decision. And, and you make your own decisions based on what you've read and heard and listened to and talked to other people as well. Uh, moreover, uh, I have never been coerced or have been a willing subject to pharmaceutical treatment. Definitely not ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, electroshock therapy, they used to call it. I've never done that. And again, I am not passing judgment, looking down on people that have or will or are contemplating. And this, there's no medical advice here. I'm just doing a cultural forensic survey of people, authority, rec recognized authority, authorities, historians, medical doctors, psychiatrists themselves who express, in fact, those are the people who I, I read in order to form my own opinions. People like uh, Dr. Peter Bregan, who was on the Caravan to Midnight as, yeah, last week, or maybe it was earlier this week, uh, or earlier, these names might not mean anything, you know, uh, Dr. Thomas Azaz, Hungarian-American psychiatrist, I believe. These, he was very influential in, in my position today. Over years, I, I read him starting in my undergraduate years, thanks to Professor Morris Mandelman, who was in political science, but he said, hey, you know, you're going to study political science, you got to really look at psychiatry and psychology. And he, he assigned, I think I took an independent study with him. So he assigned me all this incredible reading list. And Thomas Zaz was one of them. Another person that he assigned me was the uh, Scottish psychiatrist. His name is R.D. Lang. He's an individual that needs to be re read right now. He's influenced tons of documentaries, feature films. have been There have been characters that are sort of R.D. Langian type. He's a, he was very charismatic. I, I was surprised. I was shocked in, in preparing for this talk that he died at a fairly young age, 61 years old. Uh, I thought he was still alive, but, but he, he left us when he was uh, 61. But And I can't, he deserves a whole talk unto himself. But the point I'm trying to make is here is that th these observations that I'm sharing with you today have a long genesis because <laughs> I've been around a long time, decades and decades. Let me see what's, oh, okay, uh, let's see here. We have a Peter Bregan fan. I'm a fan of his. I've been reading his work for years. But DJ, I wonder if, you know, you'll have to help me understand. I'm having some conflicts here. He, years ago, was an ardent opponent of ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, but if I'm not mistaken, he, he has an ECT clinic and he has a practice in ECT. So I'm, I'm experiencing a little bit of what they call cognitive dissonance, right? But it could it be like a case of Robert Malone, the guy who claims to have invented blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to mention it here, but you know what it is. And then all of a sudden comes out and says, oh, no, it's bad. It's bad. You know, make up your mind. What is it? Oh, yeah, you're way ahead of me. See, I have this quality audience. <laughs> John Witt, he called it R.D. Lang, the divided self. Uh, it was 1960, I think. That was that was probably the first book that turned me on to R.D. Lang. And he would do all these experimental type books, too, part poetry and po He was an artist. I think he was a musician as well. And uh, But by the way, he was a full-fledged member of the psychiatric establishment in uh, Britain even though he flunked his medical finals because according to the story, he was drunk and showed he insulted all the professors when he was undergoing his examinations, but he retook the exams and they said, oh, you're, you're brilliant. We, we got to have you in the profession. And he's a graduate of the US, uh, University of Edinburgh. Okay. So people think, oh, Harvard, Yale, you know, uh, Ivy League in America. Right? To me, when, when you mentioned the University of um, um, Edinburgh or Oxford or Cambridge, that's what gets, that gets me excited. All right. <laughs> because those are the, going back to medieval times, the, the historically rooted foundations of, of the modern university system, which, you know, of course it migrated to America and around the world. So RD, in other words, RD Lang has a credible, impeccable credential. So they couldn't ignore him. They can't say, ah, well, he's a crackpot because he comes from that milieu. And it also tells us, again, do not say, oh, he, he's a he's from the University of Edinburgh. He's Oxford. He's don't, don't discount it so quickly because there's something 
uh, that can be gleaned from or gained from from checking out everybody, right? Uh, and that's what really, really, it hurts me. Not because they're insulting me, but it hurts me that th this person who's who's uh, passing judgment uh, on whoever it is um, is excluding themselves from gaining a higher degree of knowledge and perhaps even wisdom. Hey, I'll give you another example of that flaw since we're interacting here in the in the chat room. Thank you, DJ, for that. Um, uh, R.D. Lang uh, used to work for a few, I don't know how many years, three or four, not long, three, four years, maybe longer at, guess what? The Tavistock Institute, R.D. Lang. Okay. Point taken. Everybody knows here what Tavistock, when you're, oh yeah, Tavistock Institute, mind control. Uh, yeah, they've experimented on the, the poor soldiers who were experiencing trench warfare. And well, you know, you know the story. But R.D. Lang, in fact, probably being at, at the Tavistock Institute said, hey, man, this is bad news. I'm going to do anti-psychiatry. By the way, that's the term that's usually applied to R.D. Lang. He's anti-psychiatry. He's the anti-psychiatrist. So there's so even in these institutions, this is the point I was making with John B. Wells yesterday. Even in these institutions that you may think are airtight and locked down, there are rebels within them. And it's up it's up to us to make it possible for them to say, hey, listen, we're not, we're not gonna judge you on it. You can 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 come at us with a, a, a really a deeper understanding of the inner workings of the institutions and come to our side. Right. And we we're seeing this happen more and more. So let's stop shooting ourselves in the foot by being so judgmental. I've read the books on Tavistock. I read the John D. Coleman book on Tavistock. That was the first one I probably read on Tavistock. And then there's uh, the what's I can't remember. I haven't seen him in a while. A Spanish gentleman who wrote a book on Tavistock, which, by the way, most of it came from uh Coleman. And by the way, I did get a message from a Coleman supporter. This is another flaw. They said, well, you need to read Committee of 300, as if I didn't, uh, because he read John Coleman, and that's all he ever needs to know. John D. Coleman is the man. I can't, nobody can tell him anything else beyond John D. Coleman. And again, it's another case of these uh, judgmental, self-righteous, uh, really lazy, intellectually lazy and, uh, persons who um, want to just coast on some book or some individual or whoever else. Now, it doesn't work that way. And um, typically people don't address trolls, but I do address them because I want to use it as a teaching moment to show why these people are impediments to, to the movement. And um, they might not even realize it, but that's not my concern. I want you to know that I know, and I want to explain to you why we are not going to be held back by these narrow-minded purists. That's the word that I'm looking for, purists. People are they're holier than thou. They would never sit down with a gangster. They would never have a job on wall street they would ne oh no no of course they never would do anything period right so you can be a purist and um, delude yourself into thinking you're making a difference you're not you're just being lazy okay uh what else do we have here some another i'm not let's see rd lang i'm having problems showing here oh yeah C.S. Lewis, screw tape letters. This is a epistolary form, the conversation with old Beelzebub himself, right? He's he's trying to get recruits there. That's that's a classic. And children can read that book as well. C.S. Lewis, Tolkien, I think, I mean, they weren't just these sterile academics. They wanted to reach, they understood what childhood and, and youth is about and how important it is to to bring them in to the mythos, not the false mythos, the human mythos, the mythos of the human experience the, of life. They have to be brought in on that. And and Peter Jackson, I must admit, he he did a pretty good job directing those because uh, the, the Lord of the Rings uh, series, film series, the adaptations, because a lot of people will take books or short stories and completely 
uh, rework it, pervert it, probably intentionally, usually it's incompetence, to, to come up with an entirely different story. So yeah, when not when it well, read the original, not when at all when all possible, but read the original. A lot, a lot of those books you can get almost for free used. It'll cost you $3.99 to get a free book po posted to you. And that's a classic. R.D. Lang was a consultant to the Arbors Association. Is that the people that grow trees? If if he is, I'm all for it. The trees are the lungs of the city. And uh, as bad as New York City is, it's got a lot of trees for, for a city of its size and a lot of nice parks everywhere. And that was due to a vision. It was due to the vision of oligarchs, the people, the capitalists that that built New York City said, hey, if we want to have workers and middle class and professionals, we have to build a habitable city. That was in the old days. I want those old capitalist type people back in charge, not these Mario Como type people who want to squeeze us for every last ounce of blood that we have. I'm not a purist. All right. Bring back the political machines that bought all the votes. At least we could see the criminality. Now we can't see it. It's all computerized. And they're all um, behind the Wells Fargo, whatever these automated uh, voting machine systems are. It's a misnomer. We shouldn't call them. Uh, yes, Piper. That's the name. Thank you very much. The Spanish gentleman. <laughs> I got his nationality right. Daniel Estelin. Haven't seen him lately. I hope he's well. And he's a piece. He's a. It was a great proponent of these hidden. They're not hidden anymore. He's one of the people that were saying, hey, check this out. Check out the Tavistock. Check out Council of 300, whatnot. And by the way, as so far as purism is concerned, purity, the purists, John Coleman was, he says himself, former MI6. He moved to America. I think he's in, he might have passed on now, but I think he was living in the Las Vegas, Nevada area right in Sin City itself, right, or in the area, um, and came out with those wonderful books, all right? So are we going to say, oh, we can't read Coleman because he was former MI6? We can't read Ian Fleming because he was former MI6. And by the way, I'm halfway, just about halfway through of all the uh, 007 books, and I'm going to start giving you progress reports on that. I'm finding out that uh, believe it or not, James Bond of the books, and this is why you got to read the originals, not the movies. Watch the movies, sure, but but the fiction. James Bond is a romantic. He's James in the fiction, the the printed novels of Ian Fleming. He's looking for love. <laughs> He's trying to find the one. He was trying to find a woman that he can settle down with and have a family. But guess what? <laughs> The duties of the empire <laughs> always seem to intervene. I'm waiting to the, the very end. Uh, there's 12, 13 novels, and uh, I'm going to take them in sequence and see if he gets married at the end and settles down. Uh, I just finished uh, From Russia with Love, and it ends with him getting cut with a hidden knife in a, in a shoe of this woman, uh, Elsa Klemp, she's the head of Smirsch, the Society to Kill Spies, the Russian uh, espionage organization. Is her name Rosa Klemp? I think, but it's a woman, and she's a lesbian, of course. And uh, in fact, she tries to seduce the woman that James Bond uh, hooks up with, who's trying to seduce him. She's a Russian agent uh, him, herself, and of course, they're forced together because of their both the state level, in one case Soviet, the other it's British, the state forces them to come together as lovers. Kind of ironic. The state is in charge of their being or pretending to be married, these lover companions, which fits in today with, with today. I didn't mean to go on James Bond, but, I, but I'm telling you it's, yeah. She's got to be like, and this is in the 50s. So, you know, he could see what it was. And he talked about pansies and queers and he didn't use those those terms, but that was all part of the the sexual dynamic that was hidden in these books. Most people are looking for plots and exploding cars and they want to know about the Beretta versus the uh, PPK Walther pistol. There's information like that in there, but there's also this heavy romance. And this is, it's almost like a, like a, 
uh, a romance novel. It's kind of, it's, I think women would really enjoy the um, James Bond novels if they read them. So let's see what else is there. Um, I can't read that. Oh, Lysenkoism. Yes. Yeah. And there's a neo Lysenkoism going around. This is about genetics and uh, it's there. It's, it's, it's enjoying a research. And by the way, Lysenkoism, according to historian, not just me, but, but some historians say that the Soviet investment in Lysenko's faulty, flawed research, does it sound familiar? Bogus, fabricated science research. Hey, it's very much, thank you very much, Pedro Cervantes, for bringing this up. It's responsible for the death due to starvation of uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, Russians, Ukrainians, people of the Soviet uh, Union, because he said, well, if you follow my fake science, he didn't say fake science, if you follow my Soviet approved science, we're going to have bounties of wheat crops and they will be able to feed all the all the peasantry and we'll be able to build the Soviet Union into this great uh, powerful nation state but instead they they died by the hundreds of thousands, maybe millions I'm not really sure so I'm familiar they tried that in uh, the People's Republic of China with a great leap forward so we we have historical precedent precedents with what is taking place here in the United States of America. Thank you, Mr. Pedro Rojas Cervantes. Man, I should just do my talks interacting with the chat room. It's much more fun for me because I get to improvise and I get to just off the top and I might get some stuff wrong. Okay, so don't ding me. Well, you can correct me. I don't mind being corrected, but don't don't just do trivia bowl stuff on me. Um, yeah, I should do that. I should. This this is fun. I'm enjoying it. Let's see what um, Reverend Doctor James Hill says. Oh, wow! See, we have people a living testimonial. We don't even have to go to the history books, but Doctor James Hill says that he has family that escaped from the Bolshevik revolution, right? And we are seeing something similar to it, but I would call it bio-Bolshevism, right? I'm not trying to be cute, but I'm saying rather than using the starvation and the, the, the raw terror tactics, but you know, they might use it here as well. They're using a more insidious Robert Malone style bio-Bolshevism uh, unfolding. And um, so, yeah, and I had many students, by the way, whose parents, were refugees from the Vietnam War, Cambodia, Laos. And I even had students whose family came from the People's Republic of China, fleeing their regime to come in America. And guess what? Some of these uh, students, these undergraduates, were, were ardent communists. Their parents had fled communism, but they had settled in the Bay Area. They grew up amongst Antifa and all these unions. I mentioned this Chang guy who did the hip hop, you can't stop, right? They started recruiting them with youth culture and bringing them into this Maoist, Bolshevik, uh, hyper techno-communist uh, system so that within less than a generation, they forgot that this woman, she had a big star on her computer, um, a communist, she wants to tell every the world that she's a communist, right? And she lived in a a communist commune in Davis, California. And she would, guess what? She was going to study neuroscience too. But her family, and I had dinner across her, and I used that opportunity because we there was a, a, a party, a, a dinner party for some talks. We did have some moments of conviviality in between the sheer horror of persecution that I was <laughs> enduring. But, but I took the opportunity. I said, did you realize that uh, the country that your family fled from killed the result in about 60 to, it's, it's only estimated 60 to 80 million fellow chinese auto genocide again very similar to the lysenkoism because of genocide through agricultural science right scientific socialism we don't call it scientific socialism here in america because we have a constitutional with a small c we have an attitude that that is skeptical towards socialism and that's why these infiltrators have to go through the hip-hop through the movies through the soft culture in order to get the receptive minds of the youth because they can't do it on ideological out front 
propaganda. The Weather Underground had to use different front groups in order to recruit what they called the greasers, the working class people. They called the greasers. And they all came from rich families, wealthy, well-positioned, Wall Street type, like, like Will, William Ayers, Bill Ayers. And uh, his wife, his wife, Bernadine Dorn, they're all from capitalist countries. Do you understand? It's a psyop. Or not country, they're from capitalist families. They say, yeah, go out there and be a radical and bring, bring all this chaos to the streets. And that's how we're going to control uh, the entire society. And uh, Patrick Mullen talks about the Stockholm syndrome. Oh, yes, the, the love your oppressor. And didn't uh, our friend Aldous Huxley tell us that at Berkeley? You see, Berkeley shortly before he died, he says, yes, you're going to learn to love your oppression. No, thanks. We're not going to do it. We read your books and we said that's not the way to go. Thank you very much, Aldous Huxley, for your service. I didn't realize you were when I was reading them that you were making fun of us. I thought you were warning us, but you were mocking us, just like uh, Dr. Um, Robert Malone is supposedly warning us of the spike protein virus, but at the same time, he's wearing the necktie with the spike, 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 I'm sorry, spike protein virus to mock us. This is what they call duper's delight. They like to shove it in your face. The, the criminal likes to tell you how he's getting over on you. He just can't help himself. And that's how they get busted, especially if you're adept in the art of cultural forensics. <laughs> I'm being a little self-mocking. I hope you realize that. Let's see what Thermopsterful says. Okay, there, there you go. <laughs> if you just scratch the surface of all these characters, they could be mainstream politicians as well as people who are supposedly radicals like Antifa. Right? You scratch the surface of them and it's like the daddy or the mama or both are like vice presidents of Bank of America. You know, that's Cory Booker, man. He's black, man. He's like Black Lives Matter. He went to Stanford University. He was a varsity football player. He was like a Mr. Everything, but he's an oppressed black man. It's Cory Booker, right? Hey, you know what? Stop playing that card. We're not buying it anymore. <laughs> no more. I'm from the ghetto, Cory Booker. You're not from the ghetto. I grew up in the hood. Uh, okay, Politi Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's the second oldest profession. Uh, I, I would argue it's probably the, the oldest profession, and I don't want to dis disrespect prosti prostitutes, you know, I think we're insulting them um, by imp imp impugning their, their morality. Okay, let me um go in a little bit too, if, if I can get out of the um. I'll leave the chat room for a moment, but talk a little bit about Nile Rogers because I think I gave him short shrift. I think people might have been angry that I didn't really get to talk about him because, you know, why the book's here. And I hope that you'll read it for yourself whether, rather than me just giving you an overview. I'm not being fair to the book and to the, the work and the life, really, that Nile Rogers put, in, put in, into this. But there's a scene here on page 61 that tells me how he became a dissociated person within a dissociative society. And it sounds like one of those Jedi mind tricks that are done by these Mid Operation CIA, Midnight Climax, uh, Operation Chaos, you know, MK Ultra that you mentioned. It sounded like he ran afoul of one of these at the at the tender age of age 13. He talks about going to a teenage fair, which I used to go to uh, at the Hollywood Palladium. This is one of the venues in uh, West Hollywood, in Los Angeles. And coming out of the fair, he ran into these freaks. They were called freaks back then. And then later on, you know that uh, now Rogers and Bernard Edwards did a tune called Le Freak. Maybe it was an homage to these people. But it turns out there were these, uh, he calls it uh, hippie happenstance. There were these hippies. He was 13 years old. And he was brought up to this, I guess that you could call it a mansion, up there in the hills above the Hollywood Palladium. That's where all the movie stars live and the bankers and... Um, you know, the uh, bourgeoisie, if you want to call them that, they live up there, the entertainment people, the party people. And that's where he was introduced to LSD as a 14, uh, 13 year old 
I'll call him a child. I mean, you know, he, he's definitely not an adult. And they gave it to him. And guess who was at that party? This is where hippie happens, Dan, you know. He calls it hippie. I don't think it was any of us. Not it was hippie, yes, but it was not happenstance. Because guess who was at that party where he turned on LSD for the first time? Now Rogers, none other than Dr. Timothy Leary of the Harvard psilocybin experiments. He just happened to be at that Hollywood Hills mansion, right, with all the movie stars and celebrities, and uh, maybe some higher level medical doctors over at the VA over by UCLA, the, the Veterans Administration Hospital out on Wilshire Boulevard, you know, that area there. Um, Timothy Leary just happened to be there. And he mentioned that running into these two black kids at this party 20 years later in one of his talks. And Nile Rogers happened to be at that very talk. And by this time, Nile Rogers had become a celebrity in his own right in the music field and say, hey, Dr. Leary, I was that black kid that you're talking about. So there you go, hippie happenstance. Now there's more, and it goes back even earlier to that. Um, Nile Rogers grew up, as I told you, in a family of junkies. That's his description, their, their description. They were into heroin. They were down in Greenwich Village, the village of leg legend, right? A little bit after Dylan, a little bit after, but but the cachet was still there. The kind of the thing called kind of culture and the sort of beatnik culture, uh, the refuseniks of straight capitalist society would congregate. Working class, a lot of radicals, a lot of socialists, leftists living then because it was cheap back then. Today you you can't you can't find a place. I was able to live on uh, Washington Place. I lived there for about uh, six months or so. Because I, I was teaching at NYU and they own all that property. So I got to stay in an apartment for real cheap, like Washington Place, two minutes from Washington Square Park. But the point is, is that it's not that like that anymore. You could be a bohemian, you could be a junkie and not, and not have a job and live in Greenwich Village. And that gave rise to this incredible folk music scene that came out there. And believe me, the CIA and all the intelligence operations were studying it very carefully. They wanted to figure out how to capture that energy, that creativity, and make sure that none of this radical politics ever spilled out into the larger society as it was beginning to do via the folk music scene. But anyway, Mel Rogers', Rogers parents were part of that uh, scene entirely. Um, and they were, uh, they were both strung out, strung out on it. Now, um, David Underdown, Detroit Dave, uh, mentioned, um, the, uh, psychiatrist, right? Dr. Loretta, uh, MD, uh, Loretta Bender. Here's where Loretta Bender's professional stories intersects with Nile Rogers and that of the Rogers family, his mother particularly, and, and father who was, uh, by the way, his mother was quote unquote black and his father was white. So it was an interracial marriage before that was cool, right? Um, they were that bohemian. They went against all the, all the prescribed norms, including that of straight society. Don't be a junkie, don't be an addict and whatnot. He doesn't glamorize it by the way, this book here. In fact, he doesn't preach either. He's not, he's not, uh, condescending he'll still still uh, be with people friends who are junkies he doesn't pass judgment on it but he's not romanticizing either and i don't mean to romanticize it uh, as well but to finish my story here loretta bender who is the head of the child ect that's electroconvulsive therapy experiment that went on from 1942 this is during world war ii 1942 to 1955, this years, 10 years after the end of World War II, she was taking all these children and using them for test subjects for electroconvulsive therapy, electroshock therapy. And um, so Belleville, if you look at on, on the map, it's it's a walk. And I used to, when I lived there, I walk everywhere in Manhattan. But it's a walk. It's a hike from Bellevue Hospital, psychiatric hospital. And again, Bellevue is the first public hospital in the United States. America. It's kind of a walk from there to the village. Um, but they, Belleville, I don't know back then, but today they have a close relationship with the New York University Medical Center there. So I don't have any information on this, but I suspect that maybe not through Loretta Bender, 
but they were getting children test subjects from that general area and um, for the ECT experiment. Some of them were surrendered through uh, so-called child protective services, you know, uh, orphans, abandoned children. I think we'll, we'll have to check this out. And, and there are people doing this, a woman by the name of, uh, gosh, she's a historian at the University of Oregon, I think. Um, uh, Ellen, uh, what's her name? Let me check it out for you. Yeah, Ellen Herman, The Romance of American Psychology, published in 1995. I wanted to mention that because she really turned me on to how American psychology has that's not her conclusion. My conclusion is that how psychology has devastated and turned us into a dissociative society, not dissociative identity, dissociative society disorder that I talked about last night. I've talked uh, on this show with that. Anyway, Bender was part of that first wave of experimentation on communities. They're called community studies. More recently, about 15, 20 years ago, there's something called youth studies. And I look at where all the funding is going, and that's where I figure out, and, and use this as a practice as well, that's where you figure out that's going to be the next community they're going to target. They have already targeted them by putting money there. They're targeting targeting for study. They're targeting to targeting them to control them, but they're also targeting for them for future weaponization. And in previous talks, I've spoken of disability studies. Youth culture's out, right? Because they got their Antifa membership. They got their BLM. They're all those kids that, that went up to the, the hundreds of millions of dollars that were passed through to bring up a certain radical Maoist exterminationist Mao Mao uh, youth culture, right? Kill, kill, kill the rich. Of course, the rich are funding it. But kill the bougies. Kill, kill the, the quote unquote. If you're washing the dishes, I'm making quotation marks here on camera. <laughs> the white supremacists, right? Because I'm being ironic. Um, so, so you coach that, but disability studies is where it's going to be at because they want to turn us into a debilitated subject. And again, I'm not, I don't want to trivialize it or to uh, mock it or make fun of people that, that do have debilities. So you got Laura, Loretta Bender who was doing ECT studies. And then you have Midnight Climax. This is in the book Chaos, right? And you had uh, this, the, the, the documented, self-admitted by the, by the CIA itself. You find it on its own site. These programs that they ran in the late mid to late 50s through the early 60s, and they claimed that they're over. That's Annie Jacobson's role is to pretend that, yeah, we found out all the history and, and like, you know, too bad that they did that. It'll never happen again. It's still going on in different forms. But Midnight Climax was going on where? New York City? Uh, also, in incredibly, uh, it finally stuck out at me, Marin County. And that explains why uh, McFate, that person who does the human terrain re, uh, studies for the U.S. military, right? Montgomery McFate. I gave a talk on her. Her dad was a veteran who was a psychiatric case, right? This is in Sausalito, which is in Marin County. It's an affluent area. But now I understand why people like it. And, and Robin Williams comes out, comes out of that, that environment as well. And across the Bay, you've say so you got New York, you got uh, Marin County, affluent on, in the East Bay. And then you have San Francisco on the other side of San Francisco Bay, Operation Midnight Climax. And they had there what was called the Hate Ashbury, which is associated with the hippies, the Hate Ashbury Free Clinic that was run by a grad student, later medical doctor out of uh, University of San Francisco, University of California, San Francisco. But I think he was a grad student at UC Berkeley who set up a free clinic and that's where the the cops were, the spies, snitches, as well as all the powerful hallucinogens. And out of that milieu, the San the Haight Ashbury free clinic, and they had them all over. They had them in LA. They were always being promoted on underground radio, underground newspapers, and yeah, go to the uh, the free clinic. Um, but out of the free clinic of Haight Ashbury came guess who? Charles Manson. Right out of prison. So, yeah, PSYOP. Absolutely. So that's uh, Laura uh, Mindbender. 
there. There was a group called, I think, Herman and the Mindbenders in the 1960s. I think there's a movie called The Mindbenders. So it's a it's a perfect name for, I mean, who, who could make this? Is that a real name? <laughs> David, David Underdown, Loretta, check that out. That It's too good to be true. Loretta Bender. My gosh. So that's Bellevue. And again, I don't, I don't want to mock any of this. Now I talked about Peter Bregan and, and, and Peter, Reg, Dr. Bregan was on the uh, Caravan to Midnight show the other day, not too long ago. It's archived now. So you're not going to probably find that same interview uh, on uh, YouTube, as I mentioned, but none other than Peter Bregan. And I did mention this on the show last night. Bregan himself analyzed Loretta Bender's research. And let me read you the quotation mark as we fade to black today for today's incredible. I'm going to do more uh, live stream question and answer observations because it's very invigorating. But I'll also do these full blown presentation where I just kind of plow through and, and go into the state of mind, right? But here, let me read you Dr. Bregan's quotation about Dr. Her, his colleague, predecessor, she's older. Quoting, it says, this is Dr. Bregan, says, I have personally evaluated two of Bender's cases, adults who were given electroshock by her as children in the 1940s. One boy, G.R., came from a very chaotic, disturbed family. He was terrified by his father's violence when intoxicated and had been truant at school. There is no indication of any severe psychiatric disorder when he was diagnosed primary behavior disorder, right? That's the whole DSM. Slap a label on them to create a pathology. Primary behavior disorder, conduct disturbance. Okay, continuing and finishing says, at Bellevue, beginning November 3rd, 1949, he was subjected to a series of 20 ECTs. As far as I could ascertain from the records, he became aggressive for the first time after ECT treatment. GR was soon sent to Rockland State Hospital. In adulthood, he became a convicted multiple murderer. End of quote. Okay, that might be an extreme case. All right, but I say, hey, because guess what? EC, ECT is back. It's back in fashion now. They're counting on us to forget the history, and they're counting on us for to think, oh, well, they made improvements on it. Instead of giving full-blown voltage to your brain, they're using pulses, right? Or they're using less, less intrusive. Right. They have all these different types of uh, sweeteners that are putting in there to to. to and, and again, I'm not making any, any claims here. I'm just saying, check it out for yourself. Right. That's why. This process, this program here, I believe, is performing an important community service so that we can remove ourselves from this Stockholm syndrome, as one person already mentioned, this dissociative society disorder that has been created around us. I ran out of time, but next week, I promise I will go into Sharon Stone. I couldn't stop reading this, the first 50 pages or so. You ch ch it's so sad. It is sad. I find my, found myself tearing up at certain sections. And that was about her grandparents' generation. It was already sad. We haven't really gotten into her own life. She was talking about the Stone family and and uh, the other, the maternal line as well. She comes from dirt. She, she just comes from poverty. Her family does. And I was going to go in today to uh, Mia Farrow and what falls away, because I was talking about the Farrow family, first Ronan, and I got off into him and I didn't talk about Mia Farrow. I will get back into this because both of these women, again, whenever you read a biography these days, they, they always run afoul of the psychiatric or the mental health system in some fashion, almost always to uh, devastating consequences, even though they may not see it, right? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here today. Had a great week, a busy one. And uh, I'll be trying to do some music this weekend if I can get on to Patreon with some uh, material, some postings. Look for me there if you have questions that you want to ask uh, Mr. Michael A. Hoffman II. 
put them there. I'll start archiving them. I'll be interviewing him in early February. We're both excited. At least I am. <laughs> I think he will be too. Uh, for this uh, landmark interview by an author who deserves far larger an audience than he are. He has a huge audience as it is. But I think what he's saying is now even all that more important after the events of the past two years in particular. So I'm excited about it. God willing, we'll be back. And I wish you a, a terrific uh, weekend. Thank you very much again. I appreciate it. Bye.